Hello, and today we're going to be talking about angular kinematics or rotational kinematics. Remember that kinematics in linear motion meant that we weren't so much interested in the forces that were causing this acceleration that an object was experiencing. We were just looking at, okay, it starts at a certain speed, it goes to another speed, that means it has a certain acceleration, that means it covers a certain amount of ground, and we can make predictions about the mo movement of an object if we know those kind of things, okay? So uh, not so much caring about the origin of the acceleration, just that it exists. And that's a similar thing with angular kinematics, except we are going to stick to rotating objects rather than objects moving linearly, okay? And based on the definitions of angular displacement and angular velocity and angular acceleration, just like we had definitions of linear displacement velocity and acceleration, and the additional assumption that our acceleration is constant or can be modeled as such, okay? Well, we get a set of equations of motion for angular motion, for rotational motion, that are exactly the same form as the linear ones. These should look familiar, very familiar, though, you know, in, what, 10 weeks ago or something now. So the angular ones look like this. All right, so we've got, say, angular displacement there, linear displacement there, initial an angular velocity there, initial linear velocity there, angular acceleration there, linear acceleration there, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, and the pattern repeats all the way down, okay? Because the, the definitions look very similar, okay? They have the same sort of mathematical form. I remember, look like that, and for average speed and for average acceleration, they look um, like this, which is exactly the same form that the definitions of the linear quantities had. And since we're making the same kind of assumptions, we get things that look mathematically exactly the same. Now, the actual motion of the object, obviously, is very different, right? You're going around and around and around, sort of the cyclical nature, you're never actually going anywhere, potentially. Um, and, and yet, the form of the math is very similar. And so all of the mathematics, all the algebra that you're going to be doing in solving these kind of problems for rotation is going to feel very familiar, even though the, the actual physical situation is quite different. So keep that distinction in mind, but uh, at least mathematically, this section should feel, you know, make you feel right at home. Let's look at a quick example. So here, here are, here's an example that I uh, acted out <laughs> uh, years ago now, but um, I'm cycling in the East Hill of Oakland. I come around a corner. I see a moving truck parked in the middle of the road, and there's a car in the opposite lane, so I just have to come to a halt really quick. And we want to know how long before I come to a stop. Now, one thing that we're doing here is we're assuming that I'm just sort of rolling along without skidding so that there's a correspondence between the angular motion of the tire and the linear motion of me moving from initial position to final position, okay? But we'll get more into rolling motion and all that a little bit later on, okay? So here's the information that we are given. We're told that we have uh, wheels that have an initial angular velocity of 30 rads per second. And we're told that the angular displacement that the wheels go through before I stop is 13 revs. Now, the very first thing that we want to be doing is figuring out what 13 revs is in rads, right? We want to move, we want to be moving things around all in standard units. And the standard unit of angle angular position and thus angular displacement is the radian. So let's mm, convert this, right? So we know that 13 revs, well, there's one rev per two pi rad. The revs cancel. We multiply by two pi. Here, we'll, we'll have the, the clickety clack of the type <laughs> of the calculator in the background. And we get, um, we could just write 26 pi, I suppose, but just to put a decimal on it, that many radians, okay? 
So once we have that, we got everything in standard units, we want to look at our equations of motion for rotation, and we want to figure out the time that it takes me to come to a halt and not hit the parked truck, okay? Now, what do we know? Well, we know initial angular velocity, and if I've stopped, well, then we know that the final angular velocity of my tires is zero radians per second, and we know delta theta, the angular displacement of my tires. Okay, so if we look at the equations of motion that we have here and the knowns that we have and the thing that we're looking for, right, which is time, well, they will only really have a couple of options, right? And you go about this a couple of different ways, but there's no direct route with the equations of motion that we're seeing here, right? We first have to go and find the angular acceleration, which if we solve the second equation of motion for that, then we have this equation, okay? If we type in our quantities there, we have 30, or negative 30, over time, okay? And we're stuck, okay? We can't get that. Ah, darn it, okay? Well, that just goes to show you that uh, we don't always go down the appropriate lane. So let's just get rid of that, okay? Switch back over to our pen and try it again, okay? Because time is our unknown, and we had alpha in there as well. So let's back one up, okay? We say, eh, we could we use this one? No, we need alpha and time. Could we use this one? Yes, double check, okay? Because there we can't get time directly, but at least we can get alpha. And alpha, if you solve that correctly, is going to be <coughs> this, okay? And if you punch all of that in, well, we got this thing, and that's squared, and then divided by 2 times 81.86. Let's see. We've got uh, there it is, okay? So 5.51 radians per second squared. Okay? And it'll be negative because we're slowing down, right? The negative comes directly out of there for doing things properly. Then, right, this is a five, five. <laughs> and then we can solve for time, right? So time, using maybe the second equation of motion, is going to be this expression. We know everything we need to know here now. And we're left with time being 5.445 seconds, okay, if we round to three sig figs. Okay, so that's one way to approach it. It's not the only way, okay, but that's one way to approach it. And we look at our equations of motion, we pick one out, maybe we take a little bit of a wrong turn like we did the first time and realize, oh, we don't know two things in this equation, so back up, try again, and off we go. As far as how long it takes for me to stop, that's actually not a completely unreasonable thing. Relatively leisurely, you could probably get stopped quicker than that, uh, depending on how fast I'm going in line and uh, how hard I apply my brakes, but I don't want to skid, right, and lose control, so eh, not too bad. Okay, now uh, let's see what I have in terms of the print. So I, I do this out in slightly nicer notation here. So first I get an expression for the time, then I go like I did here, and I get that alpha, and I bring it back over and get that same number. Okay, so just so you can see it perhaps in a little more clearly given the quality of my penmanship. But that's a quick example using the rotational equations of motion. We'll come back and talk about rolling motion and then make a connection between all of this angular stuff and my linear motion as I roll along on my bike. All right, so I'll see you then.